Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another special edition of Ineptus Astartes. My name is Ned, and today we are going to be talking about the new Black Shields rules from the Beta Garmin source book, campaign book, which has just been um, available for pre order and will be hitting stores and you know your mailboxes likely in the next couple weeks. If you're new to the show, last year I did a series of videos, I think five or six videos about Siege of Chthonia, got really deep into the rules and the mechanics of it, had a great time doing so, and it was really successful for the channel, and we're going to do the exact same thing here on an episode to start us. So again, if you're new, um, you should subscribe so you can catch all the other cool stuff when I'm able to get it out on a more in-depth level, hopefully than you're seeing some other places. Today we're just going to be talking about Black Shields and their Oaths, which is the unique mechanic that allows you to represent these special warriors, these unique characters in the Horus Heresy setting in 30k, and we're just going to get right into it as soon as we can. Before we do get started, of course, I do want to thank our sponsor for this video and all of our videos, which is HobbyOgre.com. HobbyOgre is run by Dave, um, who's a great guy, and he is a great place to go if you're looking for weathering powders, basing materials, paints, and more. He's adding new product all the time, and he's a heresy player himself, playing Imperialis and Horus Heresy. And, um, you know, I just got to hang out with him at Adepticon, actually. So anyway, if you are interested, please, well, please just go take a look at the website. Um, and you can use the code INEPTUS at checkout for 10% off his already discounted prices. So anyway, it helps the channel, um, and uh, it helps him. So please consider it. So we're going to get right into it now and talk about the Black Shields. So the Black Shields, narratively, are just their space marines that chose to leave their legions behind, abandon their primarchs, and just basically form new allegiances. Um, essentially just like warbands, similar to what you see in 40k as far as chaos uh, warbands go. Sometimes it's because of uh, their Primarch's betrayal of them. Sometimes it's something else entirely. The Black Shields are, you know, it's, it's, it's one umbrella name for any sort of interesting combinations of concepts. There are a lot of different uh, narrative options that basically dovetail into this concept. And I would like to explore that maybe in a future video. For now, we're just going to look at the mechanics and talk about how you can actually put some of these things onto play. And then we'll sort of brush up against some of these other topics as we go along. So essentially, the question that a lot of people had, you know, since launch was going to be, how are Black Shields, how do they function? Last edition, Black Shields were essentially a type of Marine that had their own sort of special force organization limitations. They had a certain list that they could use. And then they had special tags and abilities that they could choose from between in a limited sort of way. As these are essentially renegade marines, they oftentimes suffer from, or they can suffer from, a lack of equipment. And um, they do have less options than a standard marine force will. But I think you'll see as we go along that in this edition, they actually have quite a few options still. They're just missing out on a couple things that come from right of war, and then of course legion traits, war gear, that sort of stuff. So let's start off by talking about how Games Workshop thinks that we should be playing these marines. Typically these are, black shields were small and renegade forces, so it is suggested by them that you use these either as allied detachments in a larger force, or as a primary detachment in smaller games. So like less than 3,000 points. You, of course, can do whatever you want because it's your game and your house and your rules. But the biggest thing is that they're going to point out you might start to feel the pinch as having less options available to you um, with Black Shields because you don't have any uh, Legion-specific troops that you're going to be able to pull from, which is something we're going to get to. When selecting a detachment with the Legionus to start his army list, you basically pluck black shields into the x value of legionus astartus x rule so this means that all the rules that apply to legionus astartus do also apply to black shields and then all of the basic things in the shared army list appear to be available to you in that regard as well which is cool you can take i guess a black shield fell blade if you want to the biggest thing of course is that you cannot select any rights of war at all or any units that require a specific version of Legionis Astartes X Special Rule. So even if you're in your mind thinking that they are, you know, essentially world leaders, but they're traitor or, you know, uh, black shield world leaders, it doesn't matter. They are black shields. They leave all that special stuff at the door when they walk out. Now you do get Legion trait and you do get warlord traits and even an advanced reaction. So let's start with that. 
So the first thing is the Legion trait essentially is beholden to none. When included in an army as part of a primary detachment, models with this special rule are counted as being both loyalist and traitor by any special rule that targets those allegiances. However, if you are an allied detachment or a non-primary detachment, then the models with this special rule instead are just considered to have the same allegiance as whatever the primary detachment is. So if you take them as your primary detachment and you're playing against a friend who has a hatred traitors, then that, that hatred traitors goes off against your black shields, even if you consider yourself to be a loyalist. Likewise, if they have hatred loyalists, etc., you get the idea. However, if you have a loyalist solar auxilla force, for example, just thinking of a random army, and you think maybe you're going to include an allied detachment of black shields, then the black shields will only count as loyalist in that regard. In addition to that, black shields are always counted as distrusted allies to any other faction, and it counts all factions as distrusted allies. So in this case, um, that essentially means they're not going to be able to score in any way, shape, or form. So they're just here for the fights, in, which is, which is fine. In addition, they can't be included in a detachment that is considered agents of the War Master or Emperor. So this is essentially like Legionis Custodes, or Legio Custodes and Sisters of Silence can't go with Black Shields. And I think that's the only faction that qualifies like that per now, but it's just good to remember. Now, the rule specifically states that if you're playing in a campaign where you essentially have to like pick one allegiance to start, the Black Shields player is just going to pick one and stick with that, which is normal. Um, but you, and you can't switch just like anybody else. So like you can still count as whatever you want to for narrative purposes, but in the game, anybody who goes against you is going to get benefited out no matter what. I like to think about the way this these rules are going to reflect a little bit of fluff, and right away these guys seem untrusted. Like, they're specifically designed seemingly to seem as untrustworthy or uncertain. And I mean, it makes sense. In an, in an era where alleged loyalty is supposed to be one of the highest things that you can do and betrayal is one of the worst, having seemingly um, no connection anywhere or being entirely in it for your own makes a lot of people uneasy. Which is a nice segue, I guess, into the Black Shield's advanced reaction. This is a pretty cool advanced reaction, I have to say. Definitely better than some in the um, some legions on altogether. But uh, the Black Shield's advanced reaction is called No Lords and No Masters, and this is an advanced reaction that activates in your opposing player's assault phase. And this is when an enemy unit that includes any model that has the Primarch unit type, unique unit subtype. Master the Legion special rule, or whatever has been selected as the Warlord, declares a charge targeting a friendly unit under the reactive player's control that is a Black Shields unit. So if you have a named character, a Primarch, um, or like a Praetor level character, or just whoever's the Warlord, if that thing, if someone who's in there has one of those things and charges one of your Black Shields, you get real cheesed about those hoity-toity dudes coming after you, and so you fight super well. If the charge is successful, then all of the models in your unit, the Black Shields player, you become fearless during that combat, and any model in that unit that was charged and is in base-to-base -base contact or engaged in a challenge with an enemy model with the character unit subtype gains plus one attack, or if that model also has the unique subtype gains plus two attacks for the duration of that combat. So the unit is going to charge into you, but you do get to pile in. You have that opportunity to pile in. And so you can move yourself so that you have more characters in base to base with these character units, which again, characters include sergeants or unique characters. So any model that you can get in base to base contact or engage in a challenge with them, um, an additional one or two attacks. This is pretty good. It's very fluffy as well. And also, I think it's really important to point out that Primarchs being unique models and having large bases, so charge me with that big base, you know what I mean? And uh, let me wrap around you, envelop you in all of my black shield glory and just toss a whole bunch of attacks there. Think about, like, getting charged by Kabanda, you know? Yeah, you're probably going to die, but as long as some of you get to strike, you are going to have a lot of people with a, a lot of extra attacks, which is which is really fun. Now, will this reaction come into play 
every game that you play? Absolutely not. But it definitely has a lot of uses, and I can see it being... I mean, even even the lowly tactical squad or whatever will have a considerable boost in offensive output, if that's what you're going with. Although, considering so many of these Black Shield rules seem to revolve around close combat, it's probably going to be to spoilers, as often as not, but still. I would rate this reaction pretty decently. It seems fluffy and fun, targets that whole kind of cruel, you know, angry, betrayal sort of thing. Those special characters, those bosses, you know, uh, we, we fight them. We fight them hard. Now, there are also three Warlord traits, and all three of these are super flavorful, um, and would any of them alone would be really fun to sort of build around just for the way it, like it builds a character of your warlord. Um, but let's talk about bloody tyrant first. So first off, you're going to gain fear one and this affects all friendly models as well as enemy models. So even your own people are afraid of you. Uh, the only model that isn't affected is your warlord themselves, which, which makes sense. The, the coolest thing is that, like, Fear 1 is, is one thing, that's fine. But if any of your models that are under effect of your fear, um, if, if they're forced to fall back or become pinned, then you can just choose to remove a single model as a casualty. So, you know, your boys are already kind of scared of you. They're like, hey, boss, maybe we should go. And then the boss empties a clip into, uh, you know, somebody's torso and says, I think we should stay. Um, this model is chosen by the controlling unit, and you can't take saving throws, you can't take damage mitigation of any kind. You just, you just remove a model. If this is used, then you don't fall back, you don't become pinned, but instead you just stay exactly where you are. If you're locked in combat, you stay exactly where you are. And in addition to that, um, you get an extra reaction in the assault phase. This is, like I said, this is really flavorful. Any of these, like, kill one of your own to stay where you need to be. Um, those are like fun and sacrificial fear is not anything to like scoff at I'm losing one leadership in this edition. It, it means a lot because there's lots of other ways that you can be chipped. You can have your leadership chipped away at. So fear one is nothing to scoff at, but probably the strength of this rule is, you know, never you, you are, well, not never, you're much less likely to flee a combat um, if you can stay in like this. And you could see a bloody tyrant like this wanting to be in a large squad, preferably one where it's okay for you to take out a couple of guys like this. So a big blob of despoilers or assault marines or something to that effect. The next one is the Forgotten Hero. And this is pretty fun too. During a, your, your shooting phase, a model with this warlord attack is allocated at least one wound. And it, it doesn't matter if it's saved or not and including if the wound causes the warlord to be removed, then all of their friendly models in that same unit get a plus one bonus to their weapon skill and strength until the next player, until the next player's turn. So you shoot the boss and we get mad and we're coming at you um, even more so, which is great. Um, now this has to happen specifically in the shooting phase. That's important to note. So this isn't something that can trigger in an Overwatch, for example, or... Um, even like an interceptor action it has to be in the shooting phase, but still that's pretty fun. Now this lasts until the end of the next player turn in which this unit makes a successful charge or is successfully charged by an enemy unit. Um, and you can only, it can only work once, so you can't buff it up extra and you get an additional reaction in your shooting phase. So this lasts until the end of a turn when you are charged or charged. So like, let's say... This is a squad of, you know, foot sloggers and your opponent, <laughs> your opponent snipes out your leader. Um, even it just hits them. You make the save. These boys are just hopping mad and they're going to run as long as they need to. And while they're on their way, their weapon skill and strength is still up and they are plenty, plenty cheesed about this. This would be a really fun one if you are ever playing against um, an opponent that likes to, you know, use snipers or whatever else because it d doesn't matter it doesn't matter if the warlord dies from this you still get to keep this bonus until that point so still pretty fun um and definitely like this idea of heroic sacrifice very analistic i like it the last one is twisted strategist and basically what this does is that at the start of any game turn and this is before any player's moving phase 
you'll, you can declare a special rule and attach it to a single unit uh, in the same detachment. Every model in that unit um, gain that rule for the duration of this game turn, and then each special rule can only be selected once per battle. So you can get a Shrouded 6+, Rampage 1, Counterattack 1, or Precision Strikes um, on a 6. This one gives you an additional reaction in the movement phase. So, uh, you know, it's pretty cool that you can use this at any time in your turn or your opponent's turn. It's pretty cool that it does not just, it's not just a once per game thing because you can use it, you know, four times. But the, the rules themselves are not super great. Shrouded is okay at a six. Rampage can be pretty good on certain targets. Counterattack one means an extra or an attack if you are charged. Um, similar to charging. So this is great if you're going to get, um, you know, charged by something. And actually, this one alone is pretty fun, especially if you're going to put alongside the advanced reaction. So let's say you have a pretty sizable squad getting charged by, uh, you know, a big Primarch base or something. Um, you pop this rule for counterattack, and then you also get the bonus from that thing. You're up to three attacks each a base for those who are on base to base. That's pretty fun. Precision Shots 6 Plus is fine, um, depending on the unit that you're using it on. So none of these are necessarily bad by any means, and you have a lot of variety. So that, I think the fact that you've got variety and you can choose to use it whenever you want to at your turn or your opponent's turn, I think that does lift this one up a little bit. You can't see it, but I'm, I'm definitely doing a hand lifting motion here. Um, but yeah, I think this one's okay too. I think you can see though all three of these are like super flavorful and a use a variety of rules and playstyles. I like having variety in in this aspect of list building because then you have a way to select like depending on the vibe you're trying to put forward for your black shields list. Some of these can be very the the, the variety of them can make them really fun to add something a little bit special and uh, different for what you're doing. Next is the real specific thing about Black Shields, and these are the Oaths of Vengeance and Wrath. Sounds pretty metal. Um, when you select your detachment with these Black Shields, you have up to two options from this list. You grab two of them, and they're applied to every model selected as part of your detachment that has the Black Shield special rule, excluding models with the unique unit subtype. So, if you are using a special character in here, you do not get an oath, which is interesting. Unless noted otherwise, no oath may be set, selected more than once per detachment, which is fine. Now, one of the things they're going to say in the rules right away is that uh, these oaths are a pretty serious part of who the Black Shields are, and as such, they really discourage players from changing them over and over again, um, like to face a specific opponent. And so, like, when you create a roster for your Black Shields Force to be used in a battle, you should write it down so you're not just cheesing, depending on who you see. Now, I get that specifically for, specifically for uh, you know, events, or if you're going to be in, like, a narrative campaign, you should probably stick with the same ones. Obviously, if you're playing at home, you're just trying these things out. You're going to try all sorts of different stuff, which I think is totally fine. But I think the idea is just to avoid, because there's, there's some powerful things in here. Um, to avoid changing all over your warband in order to just try to get an advantage against a certain type of opponent. This makes sense to me because it's supposed to be narrative-based. But now let's get into the actual oaths. The first of them is the Oath of the Internal Vendetta, which is going to be honestly one of my favorites. Not because it is like particularly super strong, it's actually super limiting, but it definitely fits with a theme of a sort. When you select this oath, you pick a certain flavor of marine, so word of the eaters or blood angels as are listed in the rules. And then when you get started, what this gives you is a plus one bonus to all rolls made for melee weapons against that legion. However, you still you have a drawback though, which is fine. Uh, you have to charge if you're within 12 inches. So black shields are pretty melee based anyway, based on a lot of these options. There's very few. Um, I don't really, I can't think of many reasons at all to want to make this a shooting army. So I think that's fine because you were probably going to do it anyhow. However, 
You can, of course, still be put into some awkward situations, charging things that you wouldn't have wanted to, or putting yourself out there when you wouldn't have wanted to. You still get an option to choose which unit that you charge if you are within 12 inches. And, of course, there's also, like, other things you can do. Uh, you can shoot at something that's slightly out of that 12-inch range if you don't want to charge. Uh, this is something that, you know, it's, it's a tactic. There's so many units, uh, so many rules and, and rights of war and whatever else that just require charges at certain ranges. And this, the solution is always to shoot at something else. Um, but, you know... Maybe you're no coward. Maybe you're a true black shield and you don't really give a crap anyway. But yeah, you can choose within that 12 inches, so you can't just be targeted or funneled into the closest thing, which is nice. Uh, but you wanted to get into melee anyway. I don't really see this as a problem. Now, it, it, interestingly, it says that a detachment with this oath may not be selected as part of an army that includes any models with that variant, um, which is like, I could see, like, let's say you chose... Um, Endred Har, for example, he has hatred of world leaders. Let's say you put him in this army and you put him along some loyalist uh, world leaders. Um, you couldn't do that be and, and use this oath along that Black Shields force, which, you know, whatever. Maybe you would want to house rule that for yourself in that specific narrative situation. But otherwise, it makes sense because you're going to hang out with the same guys that you hate. Um, and you can select this one more than once, by the way. Um, for a different legion if you wanted to i don't think you would uh, just because again you really you're really going to want to get something else out of these oaths and you're only going to face up against only against certain foes will that matter now if you're playing it against a campaign you know that one of your opponents is going to be you know this legion i totally think this is a great idea but save some save a little bit of power save a little bit of juice for some of these other ones because some of these others are great as well so one of the things that I like here is the first two oaths. Um, you know, it, it specifically says you can only select them more than once if noted. And, you know, here's one where, again, the first two on the first page, they both can be selected more than once. This is Panoply of Old, and this is one that allows you access to unique war gear options available to models of a certain legion and with that special variation. So this doesn't give you access to their warlord traits, rights of war, console types, praetor upgrades, or literally anything else it's just it's just the war gear okay so right off there are um there are a lot of things that can happen here and it's important that we take a look and and understand carefully how potentially messed up this might get some of the war gear that these legions have is so incredibly strong that it basically that it gets to a point where the legion is essentially balanced around that piece of war gear right Without thinking too hard about it, the World Eaters and the Imperial Fists both have war gear, which is like just potentially stifling or oppressive. Um, other legions like the Blood Angels, the Dark Angels, the Sons of Horus, I guess, have so many war gear options that just being able to throw this into another list seems like a recipe for potentially some gross mismanagement by us our, your players and we will find a way to break this absolutely now i'm not saying you should do this but you can take this twice so you can find some unbelievably stupid combinations with some of these legion traits and i if anyone cares i'll make an entire video about that because i went through it today i was taking little snapshots of my pdfs and starting to make notes and just realizing the absolute scale of tomfoolery that could potentially come out of just the combination of this oath twice. The funny thing is that even, you know, even if you were just trying to make, you know, like, there are all sorts of lore reasons for your Black Shields force just to have war gear from two legions, right? It would be very normal for two legions that are escaping, like Istvan, to end up pooling resources and sharing some of those things just because of the necessity of the situation. Um, it would totally make sense in lore to have your uh, Black Shields Force raid a Manufactorum or a Forge World that was going to supply, um, you know, chain axes. And suddenly you just have chain axes, so you're all up in the world leader shtick. There are so many strong pieces of war gear. And again, you can combine those things if you do two of it 
and it just gets it just gets really silly here. This is my first caution: be careful for you as the listener. This if you go down this road and try to just make something that's absolutely like pants shitting horrifying for your opponent, you need to make sure that you are in a community that you can play with where they enjoy this sort of puzzle box um, game building because it could potentially be just really, really, really rough, really bizarre. I mean. I think that, you know, if you just take the Imperial Fists, um, you have access to, what, Solarite Gauntlets, the three-plus invulnerable shields for Terminators, uh, so breaching shotguns, which, again, there's going to be lots of Black Shields players that already have those shotguns, and, heck, you can even give your Terminators um, Deep Strike for 25 points because that's War Gear. So, like, that's that's a lot, right? That's a lot you can potentially get there. There's all sorts of other little war gear that I've always thought was really cool and I would like to include it. Um, the one I'm thinking of right at the top of my head is I love the Sonic Shriekers from the Emperor's Children. And if I were going to add that to something, I could I could make it very fluffy. Um, essentially play as a version of Fabius Biles sort of like experiments and go aberrant and then, um, you know, Emperor's Children, Panoply of Old. And then I can take, you know... Forget the weapons. I don't care about the weapons. Just give me the surgical augments and then the uh, extra strength. And that sounds really, really cool to me. The point is, though, like I said, this is the first proceed with caution because it could get real stupid really quick. And and am I going to mentally try to make those stupid combos myself? You're darn right I am. But the point is that, like, uh, again, think about what the ultimate goal of your narrative uh, think about the ultimate goal of making sure that the people that you uh, hang out with in your community still want to see you on a month-to-month basis. Next one is only in death does duty end. When a unit that has this uh, oath is called to take a morale check and not a pitting test, a psychic check, or something else, just morale checks, no dice are rolled and the check is considered to automatically pass. However, you suffer D3 wounds against which only invulnerable saves can be taken. So, uh, in no saving throws, no damage mitigation, you get to um, distribute these yourself, similar to like the way um, failing a psychic check would work, but you're never going to fail a morale check, but you might lose a lot of guys in the process. Now, interestingly enough, um, and this is really, this is really kind of fun, if your entire unit is destroyed as a result of this, um, as as a result of this oath, your opponent cannot score victory points from it. And it specifically states, this includes from Slay the Warlord. So, you know, imagine a situation where you throw your Warlord in against a superior force and you guys just get absolutely chunked. And it's down to it's down to your Warlord um, and, like, one other guy, um, you know... Or something like that. Uh, your warlord has like two wounds left, and you've got like a sergeant, and it's against an uh, insurmountable odds. Never, never can I imagine wanting so bad to take three wounds in this roll, and just hoping that uh, my warlord and the sergeant go out in a blaze of glory in the morale phase, so that my opponent doesn't score victory points off them. I like, I like this oath. I think this is a fun again. Uh, fluffy sort of thing to do it's not one that i would probably use myself but i think it's a really cool that it's included in the game as an option another one that is really fluffy and fun um, potentially does have some pretty big impacts though is the spoils of victory this is really awesome because the black shields are almost definitely undersupplied in any regards because they have you know essentially only what they can take with them or grab or you know stealing everything that isn't bolted down So when your unit of Black Shields wins a combat and could make a sweeping advance roll, roll a d6, and on a 4, 5, or 6, you get a victory point. You can never make a sweeping advance, so you can never sweep your opponent, but um, you can potentially get victory points theoretically throughout, which I actually think is really awesome. To point out here, this is the only way in a... um, not the only way. This is one of a few ways that Black Shields can directly contribute to victory points, considering they cannot score objectives because they're distrusted allies, um, unless they're your main detachment, right? But regardless, pretty cool. Um, It's also important to note that anything that wouldn't be able to make a a sweeping advance roll 
before, like a heavy unit, can't get to do this, which is too bad. But I guess it makes sense because, like, if you're strapped into your Terminator armor, it's not like you've got the mobility to, like, be um, pulling through people's pockets and that sort of stuff. Next up is an Eternity at War, and this is another morale concept. Um, when you fail a morale check caused by shooting, you don't fall back, you consolidate. Um, additionally, if a unit makes a successful charge after suffering any casualties because of a reaction like Overwatch or something similar, so this it specifically says a reaction triggered by the charge, so this is going to grandfather in any sort of legion or special faction uh, reaction that occurs in place of overwatch essentially then each wound inflicted by the reaction is actually counted towards the controlling player of the charging unit's score used to determine which side has won the resulting combat <laughs> that's that's so great so you you blast me with 40 bolter shots and and you know i take 20 20 wounds i managed to save 13 of them and but i lose seven guys um but i <laughs> i am still plus so much on the score afterwards um there is a drawback of course at the end of each of the controlling players turns after turn one any unit that includes one or more models with this oath that is not locked in combat and was not part of a combat in that same player turn. So um, you suffer a single wound against which only invulnerable saves can be made. So we are dying to get into that combat and we are going to have a very hard time losing if you shoot at us. So, man, like what are your choices here? You see a, a big blob of, of these boys coming at you. Actually, it doesn't even have to be that big of a blob, quite honestly. Um, if, if the squad is strong enough to survive the exchange of combat, and you win by so much, no matter what, like, this is horrifying. So what is your choice? Like, you either, you either don't shoot at them, um, you, so you don't overwatch or whatever to try to give them this huge bonus, or you do, knowing you're going to lose combat... Uh, the biggest thing, I guess, is that you're definitely, this is, this is the oath that makes you just remember the hold the line reaction, which is a good one to be sure, but still this one is hilarious and I love it and I'm definitely going to play it, um, in some way because it's just, it's just awesome. You know, that scene where Han Solo is just like charging down the hall of the Death Star, chasing after like six momentarily confused stormtroopers or whatever this is that moment this is that moment so a couple things just happened here um one is that I, I had to stop the recording because i was i was giggling too much just thinking about how dumb this is not i mean not like dumb dumb but just like hilarious dumb and then i had to check a few things just to make sure i knew what i was talking about so i went into the rule book and i just wanted to make sure that um when when talking about how this thing triggers um Every wound inflicted by the reaction is caused towards the unit score to, cons to consider who has won the combat. Um, so inflicted, of course, does in fact mean, as I thought it did before, saves are made. So you count every single you count every single wound you take before you save them. Another thing, though, that I want to point out, despite the fact that you're likely to win that combat because of this special rule, you are not necessarily likely. Um, to break your opponent not not much more likely to break your opponent because when determining um, who wins a combat or determining what kind of morale test your opponent has to make the minus one modifiers are for how many wounds you lose by not the score that you specifically lose by now why does this matter well because if your opponent shoots you and causes 10 wounds um, and you, you know, save seven of them, you lose three guys, but you have a plus 10 modifier, um, on whether or not you won combat. It does not mean that your opponent has a negative 10 to their leadership when they take that check. So that's important to note. You're, you're, you're definitely going to be at a significant advantage in the situation to win that combat, but you're not likely to, um, just force a situation where you're going to sweep everybody. That would be hilarious. It would also be terribly, horribly broken. 
Also, I made the choice um, that I, I, I'm keeping in the giggling. One, because it's tired, because I'm tired, and uh, two, because I think it's appropriate just for just how silly this is. An Eternity of War, uh, to recap, a really fun oath. Um, very flavorful for the kind of crazed her- heroism and, you know, definitely not really thinking about our self-preservation sort of thing. Um, that the Black Shields are probably going to, you know, work with. But I I love it. I absolutely love it. There are, of course, other uh, bangers in here as well, including The Flesh is Weak, which is our next one. And this is going to give infantry and cavalry in your detachment the automata unit type and gain Feel No Pain 5+. So in addition, during your shooting phase, a unit that includes any models of this oath must attempt a shooting attack if an enemy is within range and unfortunately has to target the closest enemy unit that is within line of sight and is a valid target for a shooting attack. The biggest thing here to note is that, yes, this means not only do you have to shoot the closest thing, closest thing, but if you want to charge something, it's going to have to be that one as well. So you're going to have to be careful with your movement um, if you take this oath because it could end up goofing you a little bit. If two or more targets are equally close, then you choose which one will be the target. If no weapon in the attacking unit is capable of wounding or causing a glancing hit, then that target may be ignored if there is another potential target in range and line of sight of the attacking unit. Words and rules as written, you still have to shoot at the thing um, which you can't wound or hurt if there's not a better target, which again, rules as written means you have to charge the thing that you can't shoot with your guns or you can't hurt with your guns. Any model in the detachment with this oath that has the Psyker unit loses that subtype um, and cannot use psychic powers or weapons. So there are a couple of um, Iron Hands uh, short stories that involve stuff that would totally fit in for this. Just full automata um, zombie, essentially, uh, Black Shield Legions. So this would be a really cool thing to encapsulate some of that for sure. Now, there's another interesting addendum to this, which is the uh, augmentic transport bay so any model in a detachment with this oath that has the transport unit subtype gains the augmentic transport bay special rule and this is just a rule that says a model with this special rule can only be embarked upon by models that previously had the infantry unit type but then had it replaced with the automata unit type with the flesh is weak okay so also, a model with this special rule increases its transport capacity by three. I okay. Now I do appreciate the idea that um, you know your your robot extra robot boys um, fold up extra nice so you can put uh, fifteen of them into a rhino instead of just twelve. Um, that's cool, but there's some strange wording on this one that I guess I'm not really exactly sure about, um, and so I'm wondering if there's something I'm missing. So this is going to affect everything that has the transport subtype in the detachment, um, which means that, well, your rhinos, land raiders, everything, you you know, you can carry the automata, which is good because your models are all automata. However, the wording on this actually creates some awkward combinations when we're looking at dreadnought drop pods and also uh, dread claws. So... Um, vehicles like the big ones, um, like Mastodons, um, they have the transport bay special rule, which says specifically that Automata can ride in them and so can Dreadnoughts. So I would think that despite the fact that the Augmentic transport bay rule says that only infantry and cavalry that were infantry but are now Automata can ride in them, I think you could still put a Dreadnought in there. However, um, dreadnought drop pods have the transport unit subtype and also have the dreadnought transport special rule, but specifically stated um, the, the unit the unit subtype of transport now sort of prevents that from working. I don't think no one is going to probably call you on this if you try to transport a dreadnought in you know one of those things, but it is interesting that that is a potential problem associated with this. Again, it's just sort of an awkward wording problem because of the way that GW wrote it. Now, this doesn't have to be worded quite like this. And part of the reason I'm assuming is to prevent 
um, other units getting in or mixing in with these transports. But that's not a problem because there's only one way that you can have units mixed to the point where um, characters um, from different detachments can join each other. And black shields, because they are distrusted allies no matter what, it doesn't matter for them anyhow. So um, unless this was intentional, or unless there's something that I'm missing entirely, this just accidentally creates dreadnought problems, which, um, yeah, I just don't know if that's what they were going for, but it's probably just a simple oversight, or at least that's how I'd play it on my table. As a refresher, though, uh, the Automata special type has a bunch of other things. Um, the 5 plus feeling of pain is great, but it, the Automata does a couple of other things as well. Um, all of these are fearless. Successful wounds with poisoned or fleshbane have to be re-rolled. Um, and no model that is not also Automata can join a unit that includes an Automata model, which is fine. The biggest penalty is you can't use reactions <laughs> because no Automata unit can make reactions. So that advanced reaction, you guys don't get it. You get a lot of other special rules, so that's probably fine. You're probably okay with that, but um, that's definitely, definitely something to remember. All right, the next one is the Legacy of Nikea, and we'll go from one extreme to another, from robots to psyker brains. Um, the Legacy of Nikea, everyone in this oath may be given the psyker unit subtype. Any model with this oath and the character unit type can be a psyker and gains the Warp Torrent Psychic Weapon. A model with this oath, which is both character and independent character, gains the Warp Torrent Psychic Weapon, and may pay an additional 25 points to select one Psychic Discipline from those presented in the standard rulebook. So telepathy, um, telekinesis, pyromancy, biomancy, etc., etc., if this oath is selected, then at least one model selected as an HQ choice has to be the Psyker unit subtype, and at least two other models must be given Psyker subtype. So, you, so you, if you're going to select this oath, I mean, you're not going to not use it, but um, at least three people in your in your oath in your detachment have to be Psykers. One of the things to note, and again, this shouldn't be a problem, but if you are looking at the smallest size of a detachment that you can take. You have to, because of the way an allied detachment work, you get one HQ, and then you can have six troop choices, but then you're limited on your other stuff. Um, you need to have at least two squads of something and an HQ in order to use this oath. So there's lots of e easy ways to do that, but this is not going to be a super, super small detachment, at least three units in it. Now, it's in, it, the, the oath notes that you don't get the etheric lightning psychic weapon, that every other psyker gets it, um, unless another special rule would grant it to you, or if you gain the psyker unit subtype from another source, such as being a librarian console. So you can be a librarian instead of buying your psyker powers through this, you know, oath, which is fun now does this matter to us well what's the warp torrent psychic weapon do let's find out so warp torrent is like a lot of other psychic weapons it has two settings it has um the torrent and the malignant and um torrent is 12 inch range strength 5 ap5 assault 2 deflagrate and malignant force so short range strength 5 Wounding on threes against marine bodies anyway, assault two, and deflagrate. Pretty cool. The malignant rating has 12 inches, strength five, AP three, assault two, deflagrate, and malignant force as well. However, the strength has a little asterisk by it, and so does the assault. Now, malignant force is pretty funny. Any psyker with the warp torrent psychic weapon can choose to have the unit that they are part of suffer perils of the warp before making an attack with this weapon. If it's not chosen, then you just resolve the um, attack using the torrent profile. If this is chosen, first resolve the perils of the warp, and then you can use the malignant profile. So um, the secondary profile malignant is only accessed if you purposely kill some of your own people. And if you do that, there's a fun little bonus um, for each unsaved wound inflicted by the perils, um, you actually get a plus one to both the strength and the assault fire rating of this weapon. So you're going to get at least one 
right? I mean, I guess you can you can save them in certain ways. There's there's ways to save them, but on average, you're going to get at least one, right? Um, so this becomes a strength six, AP three, assault three weapon at twelve inch range. You just got to kill one of your own guys to do it. No sweat, right? It's fun. It's flavorful. It's not super potent or powerful. It does have deflagrate, and you can give this to every sergeant in your list. Um, so it could be pretty fun to just bring a lot of like pretty big sized troop squads and just have your sergeant plinking away at things. It only has a 12 inch range, so you're probably not going to get to use it realistically more than once, maybe twice in a game, unless you're able to really effectively screen something, but still pretty fun. And again, it's pretty cool to bring extra psychic forces in here. All right, we've had the robot boys, we've had the psyker boys, now we have the weird gene boys. And this was the one that I remember hearing the most about from, well, the equivalent, I think. I can't remember what it was actually called in first edition. But this is the one that I remember hearing the most about, or its equivalent. The Broken Helix, a model with this oath and, and any of the special rules noted in the following lists, loses all of the noted special rules, but gains either the clone or aberrant special rule. And everyone in the detachment has to have that same one. And the opposing player does not get to achieve objectives for removing a unit that includes uh, any of the models with the clone or aberrant special rule. I like how that's added as a tag on at the end, but that's like a really powerful ability in itself. Like if you just had an oath that said you can't score victory points off of killing my bros, that would be pretty great on itself. So the four rules that you lose are Fury of the Legion, Heart of the Legion, Spite of the Legion, and Inexorable. And those are all pretty decent rules. Um, but not really that big of a deal when you look at what you're potentially getting for losing those things. So clones have any model with a special rule that are not also characters, must reduce their leadership and initiative by one, gain a damage mitigation roll of five plus against all wounds that are not instant death. This is known as cloned resilience damage mitigation. It doesn't stack with other mitigation rolls. A unit that includes one or more models with this special rule cannot make reactions, but it also can't be pinned. So a five plus um, damage mitigation, um, you are giving up quite a bit. Your initiative is lower. Uh, your leadership is lower. You can make no reactions, but you can't be pinned. It's okay. It's fine. There's other ways to get five plus that are cheaper and it never says in here that black shields can't just buy apothecaries so I'm not sure i'm too crazy on this one but the next one pretty wild aberrant all models with this special rule that do not have the character unit subtype reduce their leadership and ballistic skill by one but increase their strength by plus one permanently and after making a successful charge gain an additional plus one strength until the end of that player turn a unit that includes any models with this special rule begins assault within 12 inches of one or more enemy units must have a charge declare for it, although its controlling player may still choose the target of this charge. Same penalty we've seen like a million other times, and even once already within this oath discussion can easily be fixed, uh, tweaked, changed by having one guy with a bolter who shoots outside of range if you really don't want to charge. But heck, a plus one to strength permanently and an additional plus one when you charge you're going to want to charge here. Now, this one clearly is the stronger of the two, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, you can still get a 5 plus feel no pain other ways if you want. You do still get to react in this way. And, you know, you lose your ballistic skill and leadership, but you still get to keep your initiative and your strength is high. So you're swinging at the same time as other Marines. You're swinging a lot harder. A plus two overall strength is just wild. That's strength six chain axes, or I'm sorry, strength seven chain axes, if you go with something like that, or strength six chain swords, which is pretty nuts, pretty great. The offensive abilities that you were going to gain, theoretically, from something like Spite of the Legion, um, for melee anyway, don't even come close, I, I think, uh, mathematically, to the benefit that you get from a theoretical plus two for strength. So definitely good trade-off in that regard. Aberrance for the win. Next is maybe my favorite. I don't know if I'll run it because I like characters too much, but I love I love the way this feels, okay? In disgrace, all are equal. Um, a detachment with this oath can't take HQ choices. They cannot take any. But you are also not required to select a compulsory HQ choice. 
nor can you have a warlord. So no warlords, that's fine. This was going to be your allied detachment anyway. We'll talk about that in a minute. However, all models in the detachment with the character unit subtype, sergeants, get a plus one leadership and a plus one wound and a plus one to one of the following characteristics, which should be noted on the army roster before the battle begins. And the options are weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, or initiative. My guess is it's going to be weapon skill, but we can get to that in a minute. All models in this detachment that do not have the character unit subtype have a minus one to leadership. It specifically notes that apothecaries or tech marines don't gain benefits or penalties from this, um, despite the fact that they are characters. So they're just like, they're the odd man out. They don't get better and they don't get worse in this regard, which is a nice neutral trade-off, I think. Okay, why is this so awesome? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, all of your sergeants getting plus one leadership, plus one wound, and plus one to something else is a great way on the tabletop of portraying something that I've always felt felt should be uh, should be felt on the tabletop, which is all of your sergeants should be like mini special characters. In the lore, it's line sergeants that are doing just as much awesome stuff as anybody else, right? They're space marines. They're freaking space marines. And putting this much extra ability into just standard sergeants helps them feel like special characters in and of themselves. If I take this one, very much so, all my sergeants are going to be custom models. You know, I'm going to uh, kit bash these guys, do something wild with their posing, something like that. Really put a lot of character into these models. It's a heck of an opportunity for um, a legion, well, not legion, a, a force that already feels like it's just designed to be sort of a kit bash's uh, dream, right? Um, there's so much opportunity in here. There's so much tapestry to play with. And this sort of makes that happen for you. Another thing more pragmatically that is really great about this one um, is the fact that if you are selecting this as an allied detachment, which I suggest you do, um, you, for an allied detachment, you can only take one HQ choice anyway. And although the temptation is there to like, put some points into that HQ unit and make it like really awesome. The simple matter fact of the matter is that if you are just trying to like fill out a 3k force and you've got like 300 points left, an HQ choice that is worth much is going to cost around a hundred of those 300 points, right? Or, you know, 400 is probably more likely the sort of allied detachment you're looking for, but it's possible to do it unless I guess. The point is, though, instead of just taking one character, now you can take essentially an entire other tactical or more likely despoiler squad. So you're going to get way more out of it, and those individual characters are going to feel, or the sergeants are going to feel cooler as a result, and I just really like that combination. Now, there are big issues with this. Um, the fact that your regular Marines are uh, much lower leadership... Uh, and one is a huge penalty in leadership, um, is fine as long as the sergeant is alive, but as soon as they're dead, it's, it's rough. So if your friends play snipers a lot, um, expect your super cool lore-driven sergeants to be heavily and mercilessly targeted um, in that regard. Because you definitely will feel the pinch when they are gone, and then you're going to be failing all sorts of stuff. Now, that being said... Um, in disgrace, we are all equal in combination with something like um, an eternity of war becomes really fun, in my opinion, and might be one that I look, it might be a combination um, that I start off trying to play test. Um, because again, I really love the narrative and the flavor of it. These are not the, the Black Shields, a lot of the Black Shields, these are not the heroes of the, of the Great Crusade uh, necessarily. These are just like regular, well, they're space marines, so they're not regular. You get the idea. These are people who just felt like they were left out or pushed aside or didn't fit, and they went on their own way, and they're fighting to survive, and it should feel like an uphill battle. It should feel like they don't um, have the glory and the plot armor that other characters do, and by limiting and removing those HQ choices, I think that definitely does something for you in that regard. Now, the next one is cool as a concept. I think it's way too expensive for what it does. Uh, pride is our armor. All Legion veteran squads in either a primary detachment or an allied detachment may be upgraded for 50 points per unit 
to gain Line and Heart of the Legion and Fury of the Legion. However, a detachment with this oath may not include troops, and all troop slots are removed from the Force Org chart. However, as such, you know, you don't get to take any compulsory troop choices, but one existing elite's choice is now considered to be compulsory. In addition, you can have two more elite choices. And this is both for primary or allied detachments. So again, like I like the idea of just being a detachment of veterans, which is cool. Veterans are not like super great. Um, but they have a lot of options, and they have a variety of war gear right off the bat, and you can really mix and match them and, and personalize them, which is very appealing, okay? The 50 points per unit on squads that are going to, depending on how you kit them out, get really expensive really fast is, it's a lot. Now, the one thing is here, you don't have to spend this um, if this is an allied detachment, okay? So if you are going to bring them as an ally, they can't score anyhow, so you might not really care about giving them a line. And so in that case, Pride is Our Armor is just kind of a fun way to say, I don't have to spend 100 points on a Despoiler Squad when I can buy a better thing in a, uh, in a Veteran Squad. So that itself is pretty fun in that regard. It would be really interesting when trying to take a look at this list then to break down the points, values, and costs. And, and I think maybe that's a, another video coming along. But Pride is Our Armor could actually be pretty fun because um, the worst part for me is that 50 points per unit. Again, I'm probably looking, honestly, as an allied force for my Black Shields. And I'm going to build Black Shields because everything you people make me talk about, I end up building. Um... This one could be pretty fun as well. Next up, we have the Weapons of Desperation. And this one is a, this is a full page. And there's a lot going on here. And we'll talk about it. And unfortunately, I don't really like it. Which is fine. Um, but it's here. Okay, so Black Shield players from 1st Edition will recognize and appreciate the addition of this rule set. Because it definitely includes some of the weapons that, as I understand it, people in first edition did play and use. These are not the sort of um, weapon upgrades that you typically see being used by Marines. So first of all, any models that use this oath and have infantry as a subtype must exchange their bolters and bolt pistols for one of the following weapons and exchanging them for a one-for-one -one basis. So like your veterans have to replace their pistols and their bolters, etc. They can take an auto rifle, a stub carbine, a shotgun, a las gun, las carbine, las pistol, or auto pistol. When exchanging weapons, each exchange may be for a different weapon, so you you can have mixed loadouts as you want to. Squads and models don't have to receive the same thing when making those exchanges. When making those exchanges for every three models in that unit, one can exchange a bolter for a heavy stubber instead of one of the other options, and an independent character can always exchange a bolter for a heavy stubber, which is, that's just kind of cool, but, you know. All models that exchange one or more weapons due to the restrictions of this oath gain the Desperate Measures special rule, which we will go over now. Desperate Measures says that a model of this special rule treats all weapons that would have the assault type as having the pistol type and all weapons with the heavy type as if they were assault. And then rapid fire weapons count as pistol two. So essentially, your shotgun is a pistol weapon. Um, your auto rifles or your las guns are also uh, pistol weapons. Your heavy stubber instead of a heavy three is a assault three weapon, which is fun and does allow you just to run and gun up the board, which is great. But none of these weapons are particularly interesting or engaging. The Heavy Stubber is probably the most interesting at 36 inch range, strength 4, AP 6. But, you know, on the whole, the exchange is not going to be necessarily better than a Bolter. The one thing is the shotguns, which I think were pretty popular um, among Black Shield players before, uh, and many of you probably still have those models around. The shotgun's still not bad, um, although it's only strength 3, it's assault 2 does have concussive, so it does give a chance to lower the weapon skill of an opponent if you're charging in and trying to shoot, which can be beneficial. The concussive test is easy to pass, however. Still something you can make your opponent do. 
Now, again, um, this one is underwhelming to me, unfortunately, because, again, the guns, you have to change them out. You don't get an option to change them out. And unless you're just going to go all shotguns or something, I don't see a lot of benefit in going with this regard, unless I, there's something that I'm missing. And please feel free to tell me if I am. Heavy stubber on your, your uh, characters, your independent characters is funny, though, um, but still not necessarily that powerful or great. But it is a unique way to model and distinguish your Black Shields force. And it definitely does fit in the lore because, you know, these are Marines that are not... I mean, they're probably, theoretically, not... They're not making this in change um, because they want to. They're making this exchange because they're out of the regular bullets. And so they're just grabbing what they can find. It's easy to get hold of this weaponry, especially from all the auxilia that's munching around and is much easier target as far as when you're raiding for supplies. So thematically it works, gameplay-wise, it's a little bit underwhelming in my opinion. The last one is another war gear uh, manipulation, and it features one of Duncan from the Accountability Buddy's favorite words, the taint of the Xenos. Um, so this one is that says that any model in a detachment with this oath can exchange a plasma gun or a nemesis bolter for a Xenos deathlock at no additional cost in points, a combi bolter for a Xenos Deathlock for 5 points, a plasma pistol for a De Xenos Doomlock at no additional points, or a power weapon for a Xenos Halo Blade at no additional points. It also notes in particular that a Legion Vigilator can exchange their Mastercrafted Nemesis Bolter for a Xenos Deathlock, again at no additional points. So these are Xenos weapons, and so they have, they've got their own stats, the Xenos Deathlock is an 18-inch range, Strength 6, AP 4, Assault 2, Deflagrate, and Lethal Exposure. Um, we'll go ahead and just cover Lethal Exposure now because it's present in both of the shooting weapons, and it's important to note. If a unit makes attacks with one or more weapons of this special rule as part of a shooting attack in any phase, um, including as part of a reaction, roll a d6. If the result of this roll is equal to or less than the number of weapons in the unit uh, with the lethal exposure of special rule, the unit suffers a single wound with no uh, save or damage mitigation allowed. It's allocated to any model in the unit. <laughs> so, um, just for fun, imagine, because again, you can swap these out for um, uh, plasma guns at no additional cost, your Plasma Support Squad, which becomes a Xenos Deathlock Support Squad of seven guys. You roll to shoot, and hey, you don't have it gets hot. Um, you just have, you, you just lose a guy because you have um, at least five guys in the squad. Um, so you better roll a six. Um, so if you include any, if you include these in any number, any real number in your units, then you are going to be losing models left and right. Okay. So back to the Deathlock, 18-inch range, Strength 6, AP 4, Assault 2, and Deflagrate, and a chance to kill yourself at the same time. Um, this is a, li a little bit better than the standard, um, what is it, the Charger for the Volkite, but not much. Um, the Xenos Doomlock, Strength 9, Strength, er, Range 9, Strength 6, AP 4, Pistol 2, Deflagrate, and Lethal Exposure. Um, you know, again, it's a pistol, it's got a nine inch range, so it's shorter range than a standard pistol, um, does have deflagrate, but it's not by any shakes really great itself. And then finally, the Xenos Halo Blade, the melee, and the only one that doesn't have lethal exposure, um, plus three to strength, AP three, melee, and two handed. So these are the weapons that you get. Um, none of them are AP three or better. Um, they do all have deflagrate, but mm, you know what? They are, they, it's not better than Volkite, in my opinion. Um, and you lose one of your oaths in order to get them, and you're probably going to kill some of your own guys in the process. I, I don't like this one at all. I wish the weapons were a little bit stronger, had a little bit more of a direct or um, a payoff that made a little bit of sense. Um, I don't think any of these weapons are that great. Now, if you are playing a specific vision and this fits into your, you know, headcanon for your Black Shields, it's definitely a different variety to go with, but I don't, I don't see it working in any of the narratives that I've crafted, potentially for my lists, and again, I don't think, I don't think you get much for using this oath, so mm, it's a no for me. 
Another thing to point out, especially about these last two options, the options that seem to impact or play with the ranged um, element of this army, almost everything else really funnels towards close combat and, you know, our only two options which really um, seem to manipulate the way we uh, black shields are going to, you know, shoot our opponents in the shooting phase or with re shooting reactions are just not that powerful. So... Um, that sort of makes sense or tracks with what I said before, or my perception of the Black Shields as being pretty much a melee-focused army. I wouldn't take either of these two options, although I, I like the idea of them having alternate forms of weaponry. I just kind of wish that was something that was maybe just included, um, especially with the shotguns or whatever, or the stubbers, or I wish that was just a general um, war gear choice, because I think I would definitely just model some in there just for the variety if that was the case. But seeing as how I've got to give up one of those spicy oaths otherwise, I think I'm probably going to have to pass on both of them. Now, that being said, I've got several combinations that I want to um, sort of math test in my head or just play around with. I do, going back over it, I really like the Eternal Vendetta, giving you basically a plus one to hit against one Legion. I think that's really flavorful. Sort of like a, a mini Istvan 3 thing. Going back and trying to find, in, in my head canon, I would imagine this is like, um, we are going after our former brothers or, you know, if you're if you've got a legion, uh, you're in your mind, like most of your black shields are coming from one of the Istvan five survivors and you've got a particular grudge to pick with one of those legions that betrayed you there. I really like this one. Panoply of old makes sense to me. I don't like the fact that you lose all of the war gear um, because I think some of that would definitely be um, you would still have some of that war gear. Uh, so I don't like the fact that you would lose it otherwise, so I think I would definitely see using this. In particular, like I said, off the top of my head, the ones I can think of are World Eaters, uh, maybe Iron Warriors. There's a couple of other ones that have small and universal upgrades as well that would be not only effective on the field, but also just fun to model for most or a lot of your units. So it looks like it's represented on the board. Spoils of Victory is fun, um, an interesting mechanic. Anything that plays with how you get victory points and gives you an alternate option to earn them, in this case by um, you know winning a combat and not sweeping advance, I like that. Eternity of War is really funny to me, and I, I, am, I know that's going to factor in somewhere in what I choose to do. I do like The Flesh is Weak, but it's very specific, and I don't know that it super well tailors into a lot of the other ideas that I have. And I already have Iron Hands, so this one I might pass on. Um, the Broken Helix is probably one that's going to get a lot of played. In particular, the Aberrants are wild, um, and definitely is something that I might consider at some point. In Disgrace, all are equal, and Pride is our armor. Both have really really interesting manipulations on the way the the force is designed and then also just the narrative which is just really awesome a pride in our armor and disgrace is um are, is in disgrace all are equal is is a really cool combination in and of itself no hq but all veterans um and you know special veteran sergeant characters which are really cooler than anything else that sounds really fun flavorful and definitely matches with a lot of the black shield style stories that you see in the horus heresy lore i have to say and it's been said other places but i think gw did a fantastic job with the black shields here i think there's a lot of really creative options here it provides a really unique outlet for some creative hobby energy um, on top of just being something that's very lore friendly and fun so well done on that one. Definitely something that a lot of people are going to be playing with. And especially because it's sort of filtered a little bit towards that allied detachment. I think it can probably be something that you get to see a fair amount of at events. And, you know, Adepticon's just over, so it's a year away. I'm willing to bet we see quite a few Black Shields on the table next year. Which is awesome, cool, fun, and I can't wait to see it. Um, Before we go... Just want to say thank you all for listening this far. Um, thanks again to our sponsor. And also thank you to our patrons. We do have a Patreon, which the link's in the link below. I'm not going to belabor it. But thank you very much to Lone Monkey, Dark Apostle Ben, The Uptown Garage, and of course Hobby Ogre for being excellent sponsors and helping get this content made. Really appreciate it. 
Um, I am going to start working immediately on a video about list crafting because I want to play out some of these designs and talk about which units I think make a lot of sense to include in your Black Shield list, stuff that can work well on the table and still help you tell your Black Shield story. So look for that video coming out soon as well. I really do want to hear from you, though. What would you like to see more of as I focus on the rest of uh, this book? I am going to cover the Shattered Legions, of course. I've heard a lot of negative things about it yet. I don't, I don't hate it as much as other people do. It's definitely a, a, a more cumbersome process than, well, the Black Shields by comparison. Um, but what else do you want to see me focus on from uh, the Beta Garmin campaign book? What else did I miss? Did you, did you see anything that I didn't include here that I should have? Leave a message in the video or email me at ineptisystartist30k at gmail.com. I love messages and emails. Um, they will either feature here or in the next episode of the podcast, which is also, you know, double posted on YouTube. So anyway, hope you're all doing well, enjoying your hobby, and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks.